Welcome everyone to Looking to the East here on Think Tech. My name is Steven Zerker. I'm the host for the show today. Welcome. Uh, look forward to your comments and questions over the next half hour or so. The topic for this presentation, following from shows that we've done over the last month or so, is taking a look at the Asian response to the Biden election. So we're very fortunate today to have uh, an expert when it comes to the Koreas. I want to introduce to you Dr. Busan Chang. He is also, like I am, a professor at Kansai Gaidai University. Uh, before he began teaching at Kansai Gaidai University, he worked for the RAND Institute for a number of years, and he was a nuclear security fellow at that time. Before that, he worked at Stanford where he was a fellow in contemporary Asia. And uh, before that, which is I think very, very applicable to our discussion today, he was for many years in the foreign service in South Korea, for South Korea and working on North Korea, South Korea dialogue and so forth. So very interesting background, very experienced person for us to discuss what will happen perhaps over the next four years from a Korean perspective with the election of Biden. Um, Dr. Chang's background in education, he has a PhD from John Hopkins University, also an MA, focusing on uh, international studies, international politics, and his undergraduate work was done in Seoul, at Seoul National University, which if you don't know is the very best university in South Korea. So Dr. Chang, thank you so much for waking up early on this uh, morning and uh, joining me for this uh, discussion about how the Koreas are looking at this Biden election. I know we're really early, it's still President-elect Biden, um, but we've looked at uh, the South Asian response in the last show, uh, had a professor from Europe taking a look at uh, the response as well. So <clears throat> this is a continuation of a theme that we have, taking a look at how Asia is responding to this pretty dramatic change from the Trump administration over to the Biden administration starting uh, in January next year. So before we dive into the actual topic, which is the response, I'd like to talk a little bit about your impressions of how things have gone over the last four years or so under the Trump administration, how uh, it has affected Korea-US relationships, both from a South Korea perspective and North Korea perspective. And from there, once we set that background, I'd like to talk more about what you think will happen over the next four years with the incoming Biden administration. So um, things that I read in terms of uh, what's happened over the last four years, certainly uh, Trump going to North Korea, that for the first president ever to set foot in North Korean uh, territory, that was a dramatic uh, meeting. I don't know how much impact that was over the long run, but uh, those are some of the things that I sent, I think, uh, influence the relationship between the United States and both Koreas under the Trump administration. Anyway, what are, what are your thoughts about what's happened over the last four years or so in terms of Korea's response to the Trump administration? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Steve. And, and uh, thank you for having me on this show. And I think uh, it's really timely because now it is becoming more and more uh, clear to everyone uh, you know, on both sides of the Pacific Ocean that it's gonna be Joe Biden, uh, that is going to be the president of the United States of America. And it is, it is the uh, right time to think about uh, what uh, is going to be the response from uh, Korea's, I mean, both Korea's, North and South uh, Korea's, uh, to the uh, foreign policy of the new administration in Washington, D.C. And uh, the first question is uh, my take on the, what happened over the past four years. Is yes, that, yeah, if, you, if you don't mind right. just giving a very short summary so we can set the background. Obviously, we're going to go through a change here between the Trump administration and the Biden administration from a conservative administration to more maybe center left administration. But before we talk about that, I just like to get your impressions as to what's happened over the last four years under the Trump well, administration in terms of the Korean mm -hmm. United States relationship, both from North Korea and South Korea perspective. Okay. So uh, from, from the South Korean perspective, uh, the Trump administration and President Trump's foreign policy in Asia was both uh, uh, boon 
uh, and burden, because uh, at at uh, from from one perspective, it was a benefit and an opportunity to bowl the Moon Jae-in administration because the the main goal, main main objective of the Moon administration was to have a, a better relationship with North Korea and ending the uh, this. Uh, uh, the armistice agreement in the Korean Peninsula. And for that purpose of uh, uh, Donald Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, foreign policy style and his attitude uh, was, uh, just, I must say, uh, helpful. And uh, it contributed to the uh, Moon administration foreign policy. On the other hand, the bilateral relationship between South Korea and, uh, and the uh, Trump administration was, uh, uh, in some sense, rocky. For example, the burden sharing uh, agreement uh, was was not accomplished yet. So, so it, it has both sides. For the Moon administration, the 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 Donald Trump's uh, President Trump's foreign policy uh, had a had a uh, both uh, two effects at the same time. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I was reading that the, the negotiations for the sharing of the costs of having the U.S. military in South Korea is still continuing, which even during this lame duck period between when the election has occurred and Biden will be coming in. And then from North Korea's perspective, <clears throat> the fact that President Trump actually visited, I, I remember initially there was very strong tension between the United States and North Korea, and there was name calling and Rocket Man, which is the, the tagline that we're using for this show. But then in the end, Trump ended up visiting there, which gave a, a, a tremendous political boost to the North Korean administration. I would think really politically that the president would actually go to North Korea and uh, meet in, in person there. But now it, it, the last, maybe six to 12 months, it doesn't seem like anything's happening at all. It's been kind of quiet, at least from a layman's perspective. Well, what are your impressions in terms of the Trump administration and the relationship with North Korea? The summit diplomacy always receives a lot of attention. Uh, however, uh, the summit diplomacy, uh, for, for a summit diplomacy to, pr to produce uh, the, the meaningful outcomes, there needs to be uh, prior consultations and negotiations at the working level. But the three uh, summit meetings between uh, President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un did not uh, have such working level consultations sufficiently. And then they just met because uh, the both sides uh, uh, agreed upon the one thing because they, the, the, Kim Jong-un wanted to have this uh, had they have this uh, aura of uh, becoming a legitimate leader that is recognized by, not recognized by the United States. And also I think that President Trump wanted to have this big show, almost like a reality show uh, to, to get the attention uh, from the, the world media. However, uh, when it comes to the actual outcomes in terms of the denuclearization of North Korea, there was not much accomplishment and that is the main reason why the, sub, the summit diplomacy between North Korea and the United States of America did not make much progress. And I don't think uh, there is going to be any more such uh, attempt at summit diplomacy after the Biden uh, administration comes in, because now it is not just the, the, the Republican government, but also the, the experts on the, the Democratic side, they believe that the summit diplomacy uh, Trump style will not work. Okay. All right. Great. So let's go ahead and launch into that. You're beginning to address it already. So as the Biden administration moves into power, um, there I, I'm hearing rumors about who the ambassador will be to Japan. I haven't heard anything about who it would be for South Korea. Um, but I think that we can expect that uh, what historically was the Obama strategy in approaching Asia uh, to some to some degree will be echoed in the Biden administration. It does seem like Biden is selecting Obama leaders to fill key positions within the administration on economics and um, communication and so forth. So we don't know who, who he's going to pick for Asia yet. It's I guess we're 
kind of lower on the pecking order in terms of who gets picked. But uh, given that that presumption that maybe, as you pointed out, this kind of direct strategic negotiation, such as it was, you know, more, more publicity sounds like than it was actually real content, that will probably not continue under the Biden administration and a multilateral approach will occur. So what, what are your sense, what's your sense about how North Korea will respond to that and then also how South Korea will respond to that. So what, what is the impact of the Biden administration, do you think, on the Koreas looking forward? Uh, I think the first of all, we need to uh, think about the difference between Biden administration and uh, uh, Trump administration. Uh, I think there will be uh, basically two things, uh, two differences between the two administrations. First of all, uh, Donald Trump uh, emphasized the national interest as defined in terms of economic terms, uh, economic interest. And uh, they, they, that President Trump wanted to accomplish that uh, goal uh, basically through the bilateral manners. On the other hand, I think that uh, in, in the Biden administration, uh, the values, the, the traditional values that were espoused by the US uh, administrations like the freedom, human rights, democracy, democracy uh, uh, will come back to the fore and will work as a kind of a gu guidelines for the uh, Biden uh, for foreign policy. And also second thing is that uh, unilateralism was a key word in, in the Donald Trump administration. On the other hand, in the Biden administration, the, it is gonna be more multilateral. The approach will be multilateralism that is based on the traditional allies and the friends of the United States of America. So uh, the multilateralism uh, based on values will be the key word in the Biden administration. And that is going to be the main difference between the two administrations. Mm. So how do you think North Korea will respond to that strategy? <clears throat> I think, as you pointed out in your description earlier, North Korea benefited from this unilateral approach in that Kim Jong-un was put on the international stage and was validated by the president visiting with him several times. That will probably not occur. That negotiations with North Korea as they were under the Obama administration involved, what was it, Busong? There were six different parties that were involved in the negotiations with North Korea, if I remember correctly. It was all done multilaterally, even though North Korea didn't want to do that. So if we return to that strategy, as you're indicating, that it is multilateral. The United States doesn't meet with North Korea independently. It always is in conjunction with South Korea and Japan and perhaps other countries as well. How will North Korea respond to that, do you think? I think that uh, <clears throat> Biden administration's foreign policy uh, toward North Korea, I mean, the, the, the coming of the Biden administration uh, will be uh, we don't know for sure yet uh, what's going to be the actual concrete foreign policy of the, the President Biden. Sure, this but is all speculation. It, it, it is uh, based on the speculation, it is likely that uh, it's going to be a nightmare for uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. First really? of all, I think, I think that, uh, you know, in the Biden administration, North Korea is not going to be a top priority or, or the, the, uh, as, as important as uh, it was regarded as uh, by the uh, Trump administration, because there are uh, there are uh, much more important stuff. For example, the COVID nineteen the response to the COVID nineteen crisis will be the first priority, and mm. on the the re restoration of the U.S. economy that was damaged by the COVID will be the top priority, and and the next thing will be probably China on the foreign policy agenda of the Biden administration. So probably North Korea will be a second or third priority, even on the foreign policy agenda of the Biden administration. And also, as I just mentioned, values will come out to the fore again, all the way, uh, come back to the fore, mm. uh, like freedom, human rights, or the democracy. And North Korea doesn't have any of that. So the problem is even, even when uh, North Korea wants to have these negotiations all again, about the North Korea's nuclear weapons with the Biden administration, it's not just, just it's, it, the, the, what is on the agenda is not just a nu a nuclear weapons alone. Biden mm -hmm. would want to talk about other stuff that is including uh, like you know, freedom, democracy, and human rights situation in North Korea. And that is something that North Korea dislikes the most. <laughs> they don't right. want to talk about them. Sure. 
Yeah. And al so, also the the I mentioned the multilateralism, but the multi the multilateralism that is going to be uh, uh, sought after by the Biden administration is not going to be the kind of a multilateralism that we could see during the, the six party talks era, uh, which okay, I participated I, I, well, in as a member. So how, how is that going to be different in your view? Because uh, the in my opinion, uh, multilateralism in the Biden administration is going to be more exclusive uh, uh, and uh, which is focusing more on its own traditional allies and mm -hmm. friends. For example, the first, so therefore the first priority uh, will not be a multilateral talks that include uh, China, Russia, or North Korea, but more on the restoration of the trilateral uh, cooperation among the United States, Japan, and South Korea in the first place. Uh -huh. And that if that works based on that trilateral cooperation that uh, Biden will try to launch into the Asian continent, uh, having uh, talks with the China and North Korea. That, that's gonna be the form of a multilateralism in the Biden administration, in my opinion. Uh, that's an interesting perspective. It's kind of, if I can translate that into, my own layman's mind here. It, it sounds like the Biden administration has to reestablish the basics after four years of a pretty dramatic departure from traditional international diplomacy strategy by the United States, not just in Asia, but in worldwide. So what you're saying is that Biden will focus on reestablishing the negotiations and the standards, the common standards between Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And then once that's established, then move on to facing issues having to do with North Korea or, or China security issues as well. Wow. I, I think that's a very interesting point and probably what will happen. So in that's Korea. a comment in a way that things have kind of for the last four years, have, it's like no one's mowed the lawn and the weeds have all grown up. And the first thing you need to do in order to fix the law is to get rid of the weeds and get back to a, what, what was a supposedly no, a normal policy, which had occurred for decades under Republican and Democratic administrations before we went through the four years of Trump. That's exactly what I'm talking about. The reason I have a, such a speculation is that the garden you have uh, at your home is not exactly the same garden you had four years ago. Oh, yeah. Very, for example, the the rival, for example, the 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 big picture in the in Asia now in East, East Asia is the, the rival between China and the United States of America. That yeah, is a... that is more that is more serious now than uh, four years ago during right. the Obama administration. That's yeah, that's definitely something I wanted to talk about because um, the clearly the economic influence and the political influence of China today is much stronger than it was four years ago or eight years ago. It's remarkable how much progress China has made uh, in terms of influence. But before we address that, I do want to talk about that. Can you also take a look at South Korea? Maybe some of the things that you talked about having to do with the uh, strategy with North Korea apply also to South Korea. You know, this, this multilateralism, for example, this, uh, this uh, effort to try and create a more normal, standard, stable, economic and political relationships between the, uh, the three main countries, uh, United States, Japan, and Korea in North Asia. Is it pretty much the same? Is, is, are there unique opportunities that maybe South Korea has or unique challenges that South Korea will have under the Biden administration? You told us already that when, under Trump, there were some benefits internationally, but also domestically, there were some, some uh, difficult challenges as well. So maybe under Biden, it'll be the same. There'll be some good things and some bad things. What, what's your take on South Korea's perspective right now? According, according to my reading of uh, Moon Jae-in administration's foreign policy, I think that uh, probably uh, President Moon and his advisors would have, would have hoped, uh, might have hoped uh, Donald Trump uh, be reelected. Because, because <laughs> not, not, just, not just because, uh, you know, uh, that, is, that is not because they like uh, the Donald Trump in person, uh, but because uh, he, according to the strategy that was agreed upon between the Moon administration and the Donald administration, uh, they have already invested a lot of political capitals for that strategy. For example, the summit diplomacy between North Korea and the United States. However, if the Biden comes in as the president, 
then uh, it means that all, all those uh, political capital that had been invested by the moon administration will be, uh, will be useless, will be wasted. And then now that means the moon, uh, President Moon now uh, has to come up with a totally new uh, foreign policy strategy that is agreeable, agreeable uh, in the eyes of the uh, Biden administration. So I think that, you know, probably there was a lot of uh, disappointment or dismay when, when yeah. they knew that it's going to be the Biden, not Trump, right? The next president of the United States of America. Uh, the the, the reason I believe, uh, what, uh, reason I have such a speculation about Moon's uh, foreign policy, uh, the, the line is that uh, it, it is based on uh, Moon administration's understanding of the situation in the Korean Peninsula. Basically, mm -hmm. they believe that uh, what is at the heart of the problem of the so-called Korean problem, problem is this antagonism, this long time antagonism between the United States and North Korea. Therefore, their solution is to find the friendship between the United States and North Korea, and that is going to be the solution. I mean, under, according to the interpretation of the Moon, uh, President Moon and his advisor. Uh, that was the reason why they wanted to have the, the direct one-on-one -on -one summit meeting between the President of the United States and a North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. Mm. Uh, however, however, that didn't work. That didn't work because uh, that is actually not the, the 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 fundamental problem that is there in the Korean problem, because mm -hmm. the fundamental problem there is North Korea is is developing nuclear weapons because they feel this threat, not just from the United States of America but also from South Korea. The very existence of South Korea that is much larger in terms of the population, as well as the economy that is right uh, below the uh, 38 uh, parallel and, and which has the same language and the same culture is a fundamental threat to the very existence of North Korea. And the reason why they, uh, uh, they fear the United States of America is not just because the US has a lot of military power, but, but because the United States, that is the large economy and large military is siding with South Korea, which is the fundamental and exist existential threat uh, to the North Korea. Mm. There, therefore, therefore, uh, so this uh, strategy of, uh, of bridging or, uh, or, or having, giving a conversation, uh, opportunity for conversation between the United States and North Korea that was uh, implemented by the Moon administration mm -hmm. probably uh, will not work any longer. Thank you very much for that explanation. Very, very interesting. Um, now, let's address what you were talking about earlier, and that's the fact that the world, the, the economic balance, the political balance, basically the whole picture in North Asia is dramatically different than today than it was four years ago, and this is in conjunction with the rise of China. So I was just reading and preparing for this show the United States has always been the largest consumer market in the world. So therefore, Japan, Korea, all of the Southeast Asian countries look to the United States as an economic savior in a way. And you know, Americans were continuing to consume products that were manufactured in China and other locations in Asia. But uh, under the Xi administration, domestic consumption has been stimulated through government policy. And I was surprised to read that the Chinese domestic consumption of foreign goods is now 90% of the United States. So China will probably not too long from now be the lar largest consumer market for imported goods in the world will overtake the United States. So that influences dramatically political relationships with Asian countries they no longer need to look to the United States for their economic salvation, right? We need to export to the United States in order to have a successful economy in our country. Uh, that's been the strategy from what World War II on. Now China's economic power is so strong. For South Korea, the number one trading partner, correct me if I'm wrong, is China. For Japan, the number one trading partner is, is China. And probably for every country in Asia right now, the number one trading partner is China. 
So I agree with you that uh, Biden's challenge in terms of establishing even the modest goal that you were talking about of uh, creating stability with Japan, uh, South Korea, and the United States. Japan and South Korea are dependent now on Chinese markets, right, for their goods. So it's not as easy as it would have been eight years or four years ago to accomplish even that modest goal. What, what is your impression or how, how deeply uh, influential now has China become vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Are, is it in your mind, is it equal? Uh, is, the, is China and the United States on an equal basis? Uh, as you said, uh, China is the number one trading partner of South Korea. And also China is the number one trading partner of Japan. And more and more, increasingly more and more uh, South Koreans and Japanese uh, are thinking that uh, they, they, they need to put more uh, emphasis on the importance of the Chinese market. And also it is not just the market, you know, actually uh, it is true that the China is kind of a working as a black hole of the uh, economic interest in South Korea and, as well as Japan. However, at the same time, their investment, uh, foreign direct investment into uh, South Korea and Japan are also on the rise, which means that more and more uh, technology at these companies that are uh, doing the operations in South Korea and Japan are also being uh, purchased by the Chinese companies that have this uh, purchasing power. However, uh, the problem is South Korea, as well as Japan, both countries are established democracies. They have uh, uh, the basic values uh, that are sh that, like freedom and uh, human rights that are shared by the shared with the United States of America. And, and China does not have elections and they, they have these uh, all sorts of problems related to the uh, freedom and human rights. And they have a Tibet and Xinjiang issue. And also it is becoming more and more serious as we uh, uh, observe in Hong Kong. So that is posing, I think that is posing a great challenge even even when you know that uh, your economic uh, uh, transactions and investment relationship with China uh, are becoming more and more uh, important for your own national interest, can you still uh, continue this relationship with China knowing that your values are more and more contradictory with the values that they have in the China Chinese mainland? And China is becoming more proactive in, in trying to uh, advertising or, or trying to sell their values abroad, for example, they, they say that they, they, uh, they can establish their own values, uh, so-called the socialism with Chinese characteristic. Mm -hmm. And what they are doing in Hong Kong seems to me that they are trying to set up their own uh, political systems and as a kind of another model that is competing with the so-called the American model that is, that is uh, democracy based right. on human rights. So that is going to be pose a, uh, that is a, a posing a great fundamental challenge uh, for both China and South Korea. You know, um, we've run out of time and I've only asked half the questions I wanted to ask you. This has been so interesting. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, really appreciate it. We obviously have to do this again. Maybe uh, after the Biden administration comes into power, we can take a look at the early response and so forth and strategies as they are deployed. But thank you so much. I wish we could continue for another half an hour to talk uh, today, but let's, uh, Let's do this in the future after the Biden administration actually is in place. Really appreciate it. Thank you for our viewers. Thank you, Think Tech folks. Uh, I'll be back on in a couple of weeks. We'll be looking to the East again. So thank you so much, Nabusan. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for doing this. I really appreciate it. We'll Thanks say bye -bye for having right me. Now. Thank yep. you. You're very welcome. Bye-bye, everyone.